So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Marcus Xeria from University of Brasilia. He's a molecular mycologist. He's going to talk about emergence and re-emergence of fungal pathogens. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope we're not, you guys are not starving. Um, so this is a very less uh, session of um, this first uh, period of our exciting symposium. So thanks to the uh, Indian Institute of Science for having me here. And I changed a little bit uh, my presentation and just uh, a couple days ago. Um, sorry not for not updating to the program, but since uh, it's a uh, um, uh, space biology uh, symposium, I want to bring uh, more information about, um, about fungi that are isolated from assembly facilities at JPL NASA. So, but uh, to introduce that, I would like to talk a little bit about fungal species concepts in the genomic area. So I'm working in the University of Brasilia, but I'm also associate researcher at Northern Arizona University. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit to give you some hints about the fungal kingdom. So it's the second largest diverse uh, group of organisms in the earth. This organism plays a vital role in ecosystems like soil, leaves, rocks, biological zones in the ocean. So they play different roles in the earth. And they're general characterized by uh, chitinous cell also, as you can see here. So these are many fungi, uh, forms of fungi, from macrofungi to microfungi. And they are osmotropic uh, organisms. So they can, they, what they call as a lazy diet, so they can release the enzymes into the substrate and get um, um, smaller molecules and, and through uh, inactive matter get inside into the cells. So, and we do know that fungi, it's, it's among us, right? So we eat fungi, uh, we drink beer, we, we eat wine, but it's also in, is it in the food industry, household items, animal feed. So they can uh, use be as a biocatalyst, biofuel, beverages, etc. So fungi, it's among us, right? So, um, and, but it also causes disease in humans. And this is a problem uh, and a perspective um, on space flight. So this is a uh, endemic mycosis that I was supposed to talk about, but I brought this slide to, s to show you how serious a fungal disease can be, okay? But also fungi, it's part of concern from the Planetary Protection Cent Center of a Excellence at the Jet Propulsion Lab. So we're keeping uh, working, doing, uh, trying to identify those fungi because so far 200 species were described of fungi, 200,000 species were described on the fungi. And if you can see in this tree, we can see the different levels of taxonomic classification and most of these diseases, about 80% uh, of those species, they are nested within the Basidium mycota and Ascomycota phylum, right? Together they form a Dicaria. And as we know, fungi are more related to mammals compared to the plants. So this is a high diverse group. And some studies have suggested that fungi, uh, the, the whole diversity of fungi can be from one to 5.1 million species, 2.2 for 3.8 species. So how can we classify those into uh, single units as species? So we need to use actually tools to allow us to do that, um, and 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 to and, and there are some questions about to, to all this diversity. So, if there are five million species out there, how can we classify that? How can we uh, give names according to the taxonomical level um, and um, that was proposed by Carl Linnaeus? So, I will give you some hints uh, about uh, how species, how fungal species were classified pre and post-molecular biology era, okay? So in the 80s and the uh, century, so Carlos Linnaeus, Christian Hendrick person, and Elia Magnus Fries, they proposed the classification. So the binomial classification as we still use uh, nowadays. In, and in fungi, we use pretty much the structures, macro and micro structures, that was uh, that we can observe both as macrostructures and microstructures on the, on, the, on the microscope. For example, we can use conidia cells. So this is the, for example, in this chelidia here. 
So this is a veg veg vegetative hyphae that produce these spores, like asexually or sexually. So this is a peritician that it's derived from a sexual structure. But we can compare those structures and make um, um, some distance uh, um, a matrix or even use dichotomous tree like as we do for birds, for example, to rank those fungi as different species. So there is a different structures that can be used, like for example, shape of spores, the color of the spores, and we can use those dichotominous tree to actually classify those and rank them as species. But what's the problem here? So there is a lot of overlapping morphological features between species that now we know that are genetic uh, derived species, for example. Not all fungi develop the sexual state, so they are considered asexual, so we don't have the sexual forms to actually compare between species. And there's a very, very important feature here that not all fungi are cultivable. So some fungi that you can identify nowadays for in metagenomic settings, you cannot grow them in petri dishes. So if you cannot grow them then in petri dishes, how can you gonna classify using mor morphological features? So these are challenges. But well, with the advances of molecular biology, now we can identify difference in their genetic code. And if you can track those SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms, we can rank species between their genetic background. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you today. So the, the most conservative locus that it's using for taxonomical ranking using molecular markers, the first used one was the ribosomal DNA. So the ribosomal DNA is composed by, as you say, three, uh, three uh, subunits and two spacers that we call ITS1 and ITS2. So those two has uh, enough genetic variability to actually do, to rank species, to rank fungal species. So this is a study uh, proposing that the internal transcribed space would be used to be as universal barcodes for fungi. And they bring up uh, several uh, studies that they were able to analyze all different uh, regions of the ribosomal DNA to actually propose different uh, taxonomical ranking for those species. So for metagenomics uh, studies, this is the best marker that uh, are being used so far in many different uh, metagenomic settings, okay? But what's the problem about using only one locus for uh, phylogenetic studies? So, I'm sorry, there is a, it's a little bit cut here. But um, so when you do a single phylogenetic tree, right, we don't know actually where those single polymorph nucleotide polymorphisms are fixed. For example, using just one tree, if there is one bifurcation here, like number num as number one, and two other bifurcations here, ranked as number two and number three, we don't know if the alleles were fixed in this population during the first speciation event on the third speciation event. But if we use the genealogical concordance for phylogenetic species recognition, which is a method proposed by John Taylor from the University of Berkeley, California, we can actually merge trees and see exactly where the limit of species are. And if you have variety, like, and we can know where are the trees are concordant and where there is disagreement between this. We don't, we expect it to have some disagreement between individuals. So I'm not equal to you and we are all different, right? But we share a common assessor of the Homo sapiens, for example. And this is exactly what we do here. So we can use several trees and see exactly where the species limits are and where there is incongruence within or between species. So, and then, the genomic error became. So this is, was used for, uh, for most like when Sanger se sequence technology was available. So they use it to sequence from three to up to 10 loci from a species or from a genus or from a group of family. But now we know that the cost for sequencing it's dropping. We know that the, the, the capacity of the computational capacity, it's not following. According to the Moore's law, it's not falling the dropping of the prices. So it's getting cheap. So we can have lots of more genomes. So if we increase the number of genes, we're gonna increase the, resol the phylogenetic resolution and species delimitation. So 
And what about uh, the, the genome versus genome analysis? So this is a very interesting graph that in 2012, before next generation sequencing, we used to invest lots more money in genotyping and, and, but, uh, uh, and a very low money in trepidation. But now, since we're having so much more data, what's happening here that we're investing very little money on genotyping, but we need to invest a lot of money in interpretation because of the huge amount of data that we are getting from those genome sequences. And, and, and we can see an increase in the number of eukaryotic genomes, as you can see here in the curve, uh, after uh, next generation sequencing uh, uh, era, right? Most of the fungal genomes, there are being uh, still sequenced uh, by JGI, so we're really uh, glad that we have a very good repository at JGI, but of course there are many other centers that participate uh, on, on this uh, number of species. And as I said, for example, if we increase the number of loci, you can uh, increase the support of the B partition. So we can increase that the congruent areas of your phylogenetic trees. So that's that's the that's the takeover message for when you're increasing like the number of markers, you're gonna have better phylogenetic resolution. So, and, and this is Daniel Matute. So, he so after like having many genomes, can we propose a genomic species concept for fungi? So, this, uh, so he wrote this a very nice review paper on, on fungal genetics and bio bi biology, explaining a little bit about the process of speciation continuum and the different signatures of speciation in fungal species, right? So just think, ju let's just, just stick on geno genotypes here. So imagine before speciation, we have a single genotype. Imagine the separation of two continents. So we're gonna start generating uh, SNPs on different uh, 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 organisms on different continents until the, until the time that you have two different separate populations that cannot share polymorphism, and of course, if they're different species, they not, they're not going to mate. So they discuss a lot about this, and using much as much more molecular markers, actually, to define uh, what are species, and if you're in a gray zone, which are still sharing SNPs, so those are not different species. So that's, that's pretty much what's the uh, message of this. So, um, and, I, and I have been working a lot uh, of defining uh, the species uh, limit in pathogenic fungi, but in the last year, um, uh, Venkat uh, contacted me and we started a collaboration to actually uh, identify fungal isolates from, uh, uh, from Mars 2020 assembly facility. Uh, so uh, we start this collaboration uh, between me, Venkat, and also Jason Stage from University of California, Riverside. And, 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 and Venkat and his group has published many uh, different uh, fungal strains and genomes from fungal strains uh, isolated from those facilities. And we start to dive down to actually better characterize those strains. So th this is an uh, example of one of those uh, assembly facilities and where those fungi were isolated. So these are two different, uh, uh, two different time points that they have been collecting samples. Those are the fungi that they're isolated from a place that was need to be like uh, sterile uh, or at least clean, right? So this is the initial classification based on ITS, for example. And now we jumped in using genomics concept to actually better characterize all those strains for those facilities. And I'll give you some examples. So how do we do this? So we collect fungal genomic uh, scale data. We therefore, we identify orthologs, so genes that are uh, conserved uh, among groups of species. And we started doing phylogenetic analysis using coalescence on concatenation. So on concatenation, you can put one gene along one to each other, build up a super matrix, and do one phylogenetic uh, analysis on that. Or you can generate phylogenetic trees for individual genes and then create a super tree and this, and, and therefore, we use some uh, 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 statistical analysis to actually see how much supportive are those B partitions in a tree. Okay, and I'll give you a couple of examples about this uh, on the fungi that we have been isolated. The first one, it's the isolate, uh, this very long name here. So it's a FGII L10SWP1 strain. 
So we have, uh, we did a uh, first assessment on, on the ITS, and there is, was a highly homology with this species, with this genus called Parajodontium. But Parajodontium what? Right, there are a couple of strains on the Parajodontium, and, and actually the literature of Parajodontium, Acrimonium, and some other, some other Epoticlaceae species were uh, quite confusing. So this is how the colonies look like. This is the conidial structures using um, uh, light microscopy and scanning microscopy here. So we were, based, we were able to see those, but what it's really interesting for this particular isolate, uh, it was uh, this strain where it was able to form biofilm uh, in Teflon uh, uh, surfaces, which is not good, for example, for, you know, for the special missions. So this, uh, this is a little bit uh, confused, but you can see a high density of cells growing on, on those, uh, on those uh, Teflon surfaces here. So what we did first, we used first a MLST tree because of course, we do the M so we have more single loci already deposited on the database than genomes because, this, because there was a lot of studies that was doing. So we first identify using the MLST on the only five genes. So and what, and the, and what we got here was that this isolates from, isolate, the, this parallel angiodontium isolates from the spacecraft facility. There are different, for example, from previous species named, for example, Parageodontium album or Parageodontium americana. And with a high uh, support and high concordance between the loci. So what we did next, we use whole genome analysis to actually show that para, what we call now Parageodontium torochii in, uh, as a tribute to uh, Thomas Torochii, which is a, uh, one of the uh, greatest mycologists in, uh, working with Venkat for years, are completely different using different concordance and bootstrap uh, methods or statistical methods to support this B partition. So this was the first example that we're able to characterize a novel species for a assembly facility. So this is an unpublished paper that we are working on, but I, I wanna give you some uh, very uh, uh, hard example actually when ta taxonomy can be very, very hard. I, I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, so this particular strain is a FKI L1 BKDR1 strain. And when we did a first analysis on the ribosomal DNA, there was a very low homology with other fungi from Mascomycota. So it produces some structures that was um, somewhat um, um, uh, related uh, uh, to the Dotidiomycetes fungi, but we, ha we have no idea. So there was some homology with Dotidiomycetes, and this is a very uh, pr uh, pretty like white colony with a very dark, uh, uh, background in the colony. This, these are uh, conidial structures. These fungi are able to produce endoconidia, which is a very unique characteristic of this fungi. And when we did the first MLST locus, look at this. So we take all the dotigiomycetes uh, 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 orders and we toss the ML, uh, this fungi using five losses, locus in, into the tree. Nothing was matching to it. Correct. What we did next, we used genomic analysis to see if there was any hints about if there is any similarity with other genomes. And what we did, we did this gigantic tree using about 240 genomes for uh, dotidiomycetes. And if you take a look, oh sorry, into this particular section of the tree with which this strain is, again, we can see that this strain doesn't match to anything. So we decided to rename this as a new species which was named Floridophyaria radiotolerance. And as you can see here, they didn't patch any order. So this particular species even have represents a novel order of fungi, which is a higher taxonomic ranking of that, okay? So these are two uh, interesting examples how genomic analysis can help us to improve taxonomic assignments of different fungi. It doesn't need to be a matter if it's environmental, if it's clinical, but we can actually use these tools to improve taxonomical assignments and ranking in, in fungi. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. I would like to uh, uh, acknowledge my students, uh, Bridget Barker from Northern Arizona University, Jason Stage from University of California, and of course, uh, and of course, uh, Venkat and his team from Jet Propulsion Lab NASA. Thank you so much. 
we have time for one quick question. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, so, sir, my topic is not exact. My question is not exactly related to your topic, but uh, I was thinking about endophytic fungi. Uh, if suppose a plant on Earth grows an endophytic fungi, has an endophytic fungi, and if we are growing the same plant in space, uh, will it show the same endophytic fungi, or will it be different? So that, so that's a good question, um, but. I am a, I, I, that's a good question that I need to share with my colleague here in, in, the, in, <laughs> uh, in the auditorium, but I don't know if the soil is actually sterilized, right? Okay, so if they're not sterile, so we're gonna still have bacteria and fungi on that substrate, and of course it will interact in the plant. So we're gonna have mycorrhiza, we're gonna have endophytes that will help the plant uh, to absorb nutrients, to break down nutrients actually to feed up the plant. So the response is yes, it will eventually, will, this interaction needs to be, otherwise the plant will not grow, right? Yeah, but will it be the same as, will the uh, same endophytic fungi grow on the plant as that on earth in space? For example, if, if there's a fungi that's growing, showing this interaction with the plant on earth, uh, will the same fungi show the interaction with that particular plant in space? The because answer, if not... The answer is yes, because we did along with my pro, you know, pro, you know, protect experiment, we took it outside the space station in a rock. Okay, so what we brought it back is uh, the same. So the, the answer is yes, but and more yes for inside the space station because human is living. The human going Scott is going Come back as Scott, not as Mark. So the answer is yes. Thank you, Venkat, for the help. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Taxi.